Welcome back, everybody, to Raven Stars Witching Hour. I am your host, Solaris Blue Raven, and my guest for hour two will be Richard Hook. Let me grab him right now and get him here online. See how smooth this goes. Esther was great. It's a lot of fun. Stand by while I try to contact Richard. Hello. Well, hello, Richard. It's Solaris. We're live. How are you? Hi, good, good. Excellent. Welcome to Raven Stars Witching Hour. It's a pleasure to have you on. I haven't read your bio yet, but I'm, I'm very happy to have you here. So let me get everybody um, up to speed in so far as your bio goes. So uh, Richard Hook is an anthropology major, UC Santa Barbara, ex-computer systems, and now, ah, I can't read tonight, analyst, engineer, author, poet, family man, historical researcher, forever in search of our true history. And we will be discussing one, uh, one of your books, actually a lot of your information tonight, The Man with the Mona Lisa Smile for One on Amazon.com. All of your books are on Amazon. And also the, the incredible data that you've had um, that you've been working on with the JFK assassination, which I find to be intriguing beyond words. So, And everybody, please welcome Richard to the show this evening. And welcome. Well, th thank you very much, Solaris. Uh, it, it started for me uh, about 12 years ago, actually, when my son uh, was in high school and uh, – uh, one night uh, we watched the movie. Uh, he rented the the video JFK, the movie, uh, and we watched it in our family room, and it just kind of brought it all back to me, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and then afterward, he said, "Dad, he said, you know what? I, I don't. I, I really don't think Oswald shot anybody." He said, uh, uh, "What? What do you think? Why don't? Could you look into it for me?" And then uh, I said, "I would look into it for him. I'd read some of the books again, which I'd done a long time ago." and then get back to him, and that's kind of what got me started about 12 years ago. Wow, that's incredible. And you've come up with so much information here. I don't even know where to begin when it comes down to this, but obviously years and years and years of research and dedication to this information and the story itself. So why do you think they set Oswald up to begin with? Why, why was it him? Uh, well, uh, well, first, first off, he... Uh, you know, he went into uh, he went undercover into Russia as a he was really a deep a deep cover, cover spy. He wasn't a, uh, he wasn't a defector like they've tried to portray him at all. Actually, there were a number of other uh, guys. It was a program where we'd send people undercover into Russia during the Cold War, uh, and he was one of them. Uh, so then when he came back. Uh, he he was a, a, an easy guy to frame because was a, there's was the possibility that he had defected and was on the side of the uh, the Russians, uh, the uh, the communists. See, um, and actually they weren't his his bosses. were really weren't sure whether he had become a double agent or not when he came back. So it would be convenient, I think, they felt uh, to to hang it on him. And then they were going to kill him, and then uh, that way, uh, if he was a double agent, it wouldn't matter, you see. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and from what but, I understand... Oh, go ahead. No, well, I was just going to say, uh, he, he went down to New Orleans uh, uh, the year before, before that, and uh, they portrayed him. He did a number of stunts to portray him as a, as a pro-Castro communist, uh, is what they pro portrayed him as. And they were they were planning since after the Bay of Pigs invasion they they were planning on uh, uh, killing JFK after JFK fired uh, Alan Dulles from the CIA uh, and a number of other people uh, th these guys uh, Dulles and a number of them they started planning on killing JFK uh, right uh, right right after the Bay of Pigs in six in April of sixty one. Mm -hmm. Right. So re basically, it really boils down to the CIA and a lot of people he pissed off. I mean, as far as JFK goes, right? Um, yeah, actually, uh, there were as far as JFK goes, there were there were a number of reasons he he tried to do a lot of things uh, uh, po probably too fast. I mean, uh, he was a JFK uh, as a man ahead of his time. He was for the people. Uh, I mean, but there were there were many things that uh, the powers that be didn't like. I mean, uh, for one, he wanted to uh, tax uh, the Texas oil barons who were getting a 27 percent uh, uh, allowance on their uh, income tax profits. JFK wanted to to tax them, uh, and he has stated that uh, he wanted to abolish the CIA. JFK stated that, and that that really made them mad. 
Uh, and then in the, in the Bay, in the Bay of Pigs, like I said, um, he failed to sub, uh, supply air support. In other words, uh, the CIA started the invasion, but then it was taken, uh, the military to carry it through and JFK wouldn't, wouldn't, didn't allow that to happen. So the, the, uh, Bay of Pigs was, became a miserable failure and, uh, Alan Dulles got fired. But see, really they wanted to uh, start a war there in Cuba. Uh, and possibly an ongoing war, kind of like Vietnam ended up being, but it didn't. That didn't happen. That made them mad. Uh, the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, was going to have to retwi- retire. He was facing mandatory retirement, and uh, that didn't happen after JFK was killed. L- LBJ let uh, J. Edgar Hoover stay in for life at, as head of the FBI. Mm-hmm. Uh, another thing was that uh, Israel wanted nuclear weapons, and JFK was against that, and LBJ immediately let that happen when he got in. And LBJ himself was, uh, he, he wanted to be president really bad, but he really didn't have any charisma, and he wasn't going to get elected. Really, the, the final step for him to get in there was to uh, have the president killed. That's really what he had to do. It's the only way that LBJ was going to get to be president. Mm-hmm. So he was definitely behind that. Um, LBJ was well. He, yeah, he was one. He was one of the forces. I'm not going to say he was not the main one. He was one of them, one of the top ones. And actually, J. Edgar Hoover was was too. Uh, but there were many forces involved. There, uh, the the mafia was a big thing. Um, he the, the Kennedy brothers had made the mafia real bad. Bobby was uh, putting a, uh, on a crusade. Uh, to put a lot of the mafia guys in jail when really they had helped JFK out in Chicago to swing the election for him. And then they, uh, then they started putting the mafia uh, guys in jail and they felt that uh, they'd been betrayed by the Kennedys and they, they, they were really bad. And they were, the mafia was tied into the Cuba thing really because they owned all the casinos around Havana. And then when Castro took over, Castro threw, threw all the casinos out and they had to go uh, to the desert in Las Vegas, which is not nearly as good as, good as the waterfront in, in Havana. It's like Monte Carlo, you know. Right. Yeah. yeah. He pissed a lot of people off. There's no doubt about it. You think about yeah, the it. military wanted, you know, the Vietnam War, they really wanted that to happen. And JFK, uh, he, he showed sign He was going to pull out. And, uh, and they, they weren't going to... The, the, they got nixed on Cuba. They weren't going to let that happen with Vietnam. So they, they, they wanted the Vietnam War to happen. That was the last straw. So they, had, they, had, they felt they had to take them out, and they, and they did. Mm-hmm. Right. And can, can you walk us through that procedure as far as how they orchestrated this? Now, obviously, they had multiple shooters, from what I understand, and different locations. Is that right? Yeah, I they mean, did. As far as teams. Oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, they did. Uh, it was... Uh, I mean, they've tried to, they, they, you know, they, they tried to hang it all on Oswald, who was their patsy. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, um, Oswald was part of a hit team uh, in the Texas School Book Depository. Uh, but in the end, he did fire. And uh, there was a total of uh, at least six hit teams around the plaza. And that was only one of them up there on the sixth floor. But the guy firing from up on the sixth floor was not Oswald. It was Malcolm Wallace who was on the opposite end of the floor. Uh, at the last moment, Oswald, he bailed. He came downstairs, and we have a photo of him in the doorway when the shooting was happening. Uh, the Altkin 6 photo shows Oswald peeking out there looking at the president getting shot. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so, yeah, and actually that was one of the things. See, after my son asked me to look into it for him, I discovered the Altkin's six photo which older versions of it you know in the prior century they were really hazy and you really couldn't tell if it was him in that doorway or not but um i i got versions of that photo up on my personal computer you know i was a systems analyst so i had a huge computer screen and i started to blow it up really big and analyze it and i started to see specific features that were definitely oswald's features as a matter of fact there was one night where I just sat up straight in front of my computer and the hair on the back of my neck stood, stood up because I knew that that's him in the doorway. There's no question about it. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like uh, he wasn't upstairs at all. He he was downstairs. He he fired no shots at all. That's there's no question about it. I I admit in the end I identified seventy features between the photo of Oswald in the doorway and pictures of him later at the police station. Uh, his undershirt, his overshirt, all the features of his face, his hair. Uh, um, he, he, it's definitely him. Right. Yeah, I agree with so you. So he that didn't one do is... it. Oh, excuse me. No, go ahead. No, keep going. <laughs> yeah, and there's, there were like at least 16 uh, hit teams, like I said, around the plaza. Uh, uh, there was the one on the sixth floor. Well, actually, uh, here, I'll go from left to right. There was a shooter on the county records building who was uh, uh, Harry Weatherford, uh, Deputy Sheriff Harry, Harry Weatherford was up there. Then in the Dal Tex building, there was a shooter there uh, by the fire escape, uh, which we believe was Chuck Nicoletti, uh, who was CIA uh, slash mafia. See, a lot of these mafia figures, they were also CIA um, assets. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's what's confusing to people. Remember when uh, Oliver Stone's JFK came out, Everybody came out of the theater thinking, well, did the mafia do it or did the CIA do it? But the key to the thinking really is some of these people, they were in, in, in members of various organizations, uh, like in the CIA and the mafia. Uh, and actually, is, uh, there was a hit team on the sixth floor of the TSBD. And I said Malcolm Wallace was the shooter up there. And he was a, a DISC agent, that's D-I-S-C, it's Defense Industrial, Industrial Security Command, and that's part of the DIA, which is under J. Edgar Hoover. A lot of people don't know about that. Wow. See, actually, yeah. the, there's the CIA and there's the DIA, and most people don't know about the DIA, but some of these uh, shooters were DIA in addition to CIA, okay? Mm. And uh, Malcolm Wallace was, was DISC, which is part of the DIA, also ONI, Office of Naval Intelligence. So he was on the sixth floor. And then there were uh, actually, um, I've identified uh, at least three hit teams on the grassy knoll. Jeez. Uh, and one of, there were some shooters in the pergola. See, people don't realize that behind Zapruder and Sitzman who were photographing from that pedestal. Mm -hmm. um, there, were, wow. there were at least... At least one, maybe two shooters. It's not directly behind him, but it's a little bit when you're facing Zapruder from the front, a little bit to his left, uh, in the slats of that little shelter there. Um, there was at least one or two shooters in there. And actually, Bill Newman, the witness who uh, hit the grass with his family, said he felt the shots were coming from right over his head from back by the pergola. And so um, he was correct. And we, with photo enhancement, Actually, there's some photo experts. Uh, there's a, a fellow by the name of Guy Cooper and another one named Leroy Blevins who have blown up photos of the pergola, uh, and we can see shooters in there. And in the Knicks film, there's some flashes coming out of there from that little pergola shelter. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, you know what's okay. incredible? The work that you're doing, it amazes me that these people, nobody else has been thinking about doing this, I mean, years ago. Well, um, well they didn't uh, have personal computers for one. Okay. Right. And uh, that's that's helped a lot because, like with Facebook, you can uh, work with research researchers twenty four seven, and uh, more more heads on the thing are much better than one. You, you can banter things back and forth, and it moves forward much much quicker now. Mm-hmm. Oh, it does. Yeah. You know. So. Oh, uh, excuse me. No, go ahead. No, I just, I'm sorry to mean to interrupt you. I just have so many things going through yeah, my head right now. Go ahead. Sorry. Right. <laughs> you can cut me off anytime you want. I get overly energetic about no, it's this. I know. Eh? I love it. It's, it's great. And it's, it's, this information has to be heard. So go ahead. Yeah. Then, uh, so there were, there was at least one, maybe two shooters in that pergola there. Now, in the next film, which is the other major film, other than the Zapruder film, which shows the shooting from the other direction, from the infield side, we can see a shooter in, an, in enhancements up between the pergola and the fence standing up there. When you blow up the head, he matches the, the tall member of the three tramps. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the photo of the three tramps. It's 
these three guys who were arrested and being marched across the plaza after the shooting. Uh, the tall member of the three tramps, it's Charles Harrelson. Uh, he was he worked for the CIA and he matches the head of the guy shooting to the to the right of the pergola. So it's we're pretty sure that um, that the, those three tramps being marched out of there weren't just arrested on a rail car. They were they were a hit team, uh, and he was the shooter. The guy with the hat uh, in the back, Chauncey Hold, had a radio, a communications radio, and he admitted it actually that he had a radio. So they were a hit team. And then if you go a little bit left of that to the upper picket fence, most people have seen pictures of the badge man, which was a Dallas policeman behind the fence there, uh, which was Roscoe White. Uh, and he was a shooter from there. Uh, and that's, that's uh, very certain. They actually found his diary, uh, his son did, at, at the cabin around 1980, where uh, it, he, he just discussed in his journal of how he'd shot the president, uh, Roscoe White. Wow. So, yeah, he was a Dallas policeman. Now, what he was, he wasn't just Dallas police. He was also CIA, and they planted him in the Dallas police on October 7th. So he had just been hired, Roscoe White. Uh, and we also have a, a testimony of a fellow by the name of Ron Lewis who saw Roscoe White the previous summer down in New Orleans getting trained by Frank Sturgis of the CIA to be a shooter. So we know Roscoe White uh, was trained and he was planted in the Dallas police and he was up there behind the fence as a shooter. Wow. Well, that's, that's yeah, incredible. so he, that's for certain there. Okay, then now, the, now if you go down lower on the picket fence, uh, where everybody's familiar with the final devastating headshot, uh, which was between about 30 feet uh, from the fence corner to the triple uh, underpass, there was a, a, a hit team behind there, uh, and they've been identified. It's, it's virtually certain, and actually he confessed to being a shooter is this um, uh, a uh, guy by the name of James Files, who has a book out, Files on JFK. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with James Files, but there's a people can go on YouTube and listen to his confession. Mm -hmm. But he confessed to firing the final headshot, and I, a lot of people said it wasn't true. And at first, I I didn't think so, uh, but now that I do, I do believe he fired it. But there was another guy with him, and I believe it was Frank Sturgis, who was a manager the CIA manager of the overall uh, picket fence hit teams, upper with Roscoe White and lower with James Files. Frank Sturgis was there, and actually uh, after Files fired the devastating headshot, he gave the rifle to Roscoe White, who ran it down the length of the fence and tossed it to another guy by the railroad switch box who, uh, uh, who disconnected the rifle in two, put it in a bag, and ran off across the rail, rail yard. And there was a witness... Uh, sitting out by the highway who saw that happen uh, by the name of uh, Ed Hoffman, who passed away in 2007. Uh, but uh, there's a, a number of counts, accounts on the Internet of Ed Hoffman who describes this action of a shot being fired and then uh, a man uh, in a business suit running down the length of the fence, which fits, fits the description of Frank Sturgis, uh, who running the length of the fence with a rifle and tossing it to another guy. So we're pretty sure the lower picket fence hit team was James Files, fired the shots, and Frank Sturgis evacuated the rifle. Wow, that's incredible. You know, so many groups, there were so many shooters there. That's very interesting. This was well orchestrated. There's no doubt about that. Right. Well, my perception of it is now, you know, a lot of this, I'm just one of many researchers, but my perception of it is, um, is that, see, they, they wanted Oswald to shoot him uh, from behind, but he didn't do it. See, if he had done what he had been ordered to do, they might not have had to shoot him from below, and it wouldn't have been obvious. Then uh, it would just, Oswald just would have been cleanly framed, and actually he, he would have done it. Uh, but there was another guy up there. there, there uh, on the sixth floor of the, of the book depository, there was Mac Wallace, Lee Oswald, Ruth Ann Martinez, who was a radio operator, and Lawrence Loy Factor, who was another hired gun. So they, they'd ordered 
Roy Factor and Lee Oswald to shoot JFK in the, in the head from behind, and neither of them did it. That's why um, JFK was still sitting straight up for a long time there. He, he'd been hit once in the throat from the front, uh, but he was still sitting up. The job hadn't got done. See, I, I don't think they didn't want to do it the way they did it. They would have rather uh, it had been done by behind, from behind, but they had to use these guys down by the picket fence as a last resort because they couldn't let them cruise out of their lives. See, that, that was the thing. Well, yeah, when you think about it now, am, am I making a mistake in this? But I, I was under the impression that there were um, only a few people that actually had the kill shots. and But didn't everybody take a hit towards them? Didn't everybody shoot at them at the same time or no? Um, there were actually, well, we don't know exactly, and we probably never, there's probably never any way to know exactly. But my conclusion have, have been, uh, actually, there were at least eight shooters and 12 shots fired. That's my opinion. Wow. Uh, here, I, here, I'll just list off, off the ones that we know. Okay. Uh, there, there was one that went off the street that didn't hit anything in the beginning. There was an initial shot that sounded like a firecracker, and nobody was hit. In my opinion, that's Loy Factor up there who had been ordered to shoot by Wallace, but he, didn't, he never wanted to shoot the president. They trapped Loy Factor into the job. They, they told... They hired him for a job, and they didn't tell him he was going to be shooting the president till the last day. <laughs> till he, till the last day. They, he, in the, in the, there's a book called The Men on the Sixth Floor where he, tell, he, he passed away in the 1990s, but he tells the story of how they let him into the depository, and he realized then that he was going to have to shoot the, the president, and he was so scared. You, you just can't even imagine what it was like for the guy. So he got up there and he shot, in my opinion, he shot into the street. So that was one. There was another shot, the upper chrome edging of the windshield that didn't hit anything. There's a, a bullet uh, mark in, up there that didn't ha- hit anything. That's two. Uh, JFK was hit in the back uh, that, uh, that stopped right there. That's three. John Conley was hit in the back that went into his leg. That's four. JFK was hit in the throat from the front. That's five. Um, he was hit at least twice in the head. That that that's seven. Uh, there was a, a hole in the windshield. Uh, that that that's eight. I mean, there was fragments on the hole. Actually, and they found a bullet by the manhole cover on the infield. Uh, uh, you know, this this stuff is all very unpleasant. You know, but it's best that we face it. Uh, you know, I apologize if it sounds morbid, but I believe that it's best that this is faced head on. So that's, that's the reason I just go ahead and present it this way. That's just, I just wanted to explain that. No, I'm okay. so glad you did. Yeah. Yeah. They, they found a bullet on the infield by the manhole cover in a clump of blood and brain matter uh, that was like a, uh, a short range weapon type round. And they, they don't know where that came from. So there may be, have been a pistol involved too. It's a pistol. Yeah. A pistol round, so that certainly would have been fired out of a Mauser, like they said, or a, or a Carcano, like they said Oswald had. So, I mean, there were multiple weapons. Uh, there, there were mul- there were all kinds of shots. They, the car immediately uh, was taken and rebuilt in Chicago. LBJ was in charge of that. They, I mean, there was probably damage all over that car. We'll never know how many. Uh, holes and how much damage was done. I'm sure it was very, very extensive. Right. Didn't he want the car for himself, though? Didn't he want to keep the car or something like that? Um, I'm not sure about that, but I think now they have a car. Uh, they have one in a museum somewhere. Oh, okay. uh, it, may, it may be in Chicago, but, I mean, it was completely completely rebuilt, you know. Mm-hmm. Very interesting, but, but obviously he took the evidence if there was any. <laughs> with else. Well, that was the whole thing. I mean, um, they immediately got hold of the car. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, it's, it's it, looking at it now, it's just completely ridiculous. I mean, there, there, actually, there, there was another fellow, James Tegg, down by the triple underpass, who was hit by a uh, wounded cut in the cheek by a bullet that ricocheted by there. I mean, mm-hmm. so there were, bullet, there were bullets all over the place. Uh, uh, and JFK's body, uh, they took it out of Dallas, so... I uh, wasn't able to be autopsied there like uh, the law says it's, it's, it's supposed to be, you know. Mm-hmm. 
Exactly. So, I mean, if it had been, if it had been, we could have seen the dam, we could have really inventoried the physical damage, but they took it, they took him away, uh, back East to Bethesda. And then, uh, the account there is all mixed up. I mean, uh, you can't go by anything at that point. They even said there's people that, that said there was a second, second corpse back there, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, I can't imagine is how they were able to pull it off as far as, as pinning it on Lee Harvey Oswald and nobody really questioned anything. I mean, if you were hearing all these shots going everywhere, why didn't people say something? Even the people that were in the crowds, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, well, actually, uh, a lot of them did say something. Actually, there was like 60 witnesses that said the shots came from the fence. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, they, uh, they immediately, the FBI swooped in and they confiscated cameras and film. Uh, there, were, there were a number of uh, uh, films and cameras that were confiscated. Um, uh, immediately, they were immediately on hand to get that bullet by the manhole cover, there's a, a, an FBI. We have pictures of him. Immediately, he was there, standing there. His name, he was identified by Jim Garrison as having been Robert Barrett of the FBI. And he denied even having been there when he's standing there right there in the picture. Uh, but at the Clay Shaw trial in New Orleans, Robert Barrett denied that it was him. But, uh, yeah, you would think so, uh, Solaris. Uh, the thing is, it's, it's hard for me. I was seven years old at the time. I was a little boy. I knew something wasn't right. But the only thing I can say to people to explain, it was like another, it was literally uh, like another, a complete other world back then. We, uh, we lived in a, a media control world where there was only about three or four TV channels and a couple of magazines. We re- people, when they were told that something was happened a certain way by the government, they believed it. They didn't doubt it. Right. You know, and uh, if they heard uh, uh, other shots, some of them just went into a state of denial. Uh, it was literally another world back then. But even as a little boy, I can remember watching TV where Oswald was being dragged through the police station that Saturday. I saw it on my black and white TV. He was yelling, I, I didn't do it. I was just a patsy. And I, I remember thinking as a little boy, that guy doesn't look like a killer. I actually remember thinking that, mm-hmm. you know, um, he doesn't look like he does. I, I remember thinking he doesn't look like a bad guy. I know that doesn't mean anything, but that's what I thought just as a little kid. Uh, and it didn't, it didn't add up. Uh, actually, then on Sunday, when uh, Jack Ruby uh, shot uh, Lee Oswald, I re- remember on TV watching that with my father, who was an ex-military guy, and he said, well, obviously, uh, that's a mob guy shooting Oswald to shut him up. I mean, my dad said it immediately, you know. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> so, and, you know, it was, a, it was really a, it was the craziest weekend, really, Solaris. I mean, you just had to live through it. I mean... JFK was shot on Friday. Uh, Lee Oswald was shot on Sunday, and then JFK's funeral was on Monday. And everybody was just so stunned; they really didn't even know what had hit them. You know, mm-hmm. exactly. The president was gone. I, it's just I can't, It's hard to believe even now. I mean, JFK. Uh, he was he was loved by so many people. He had such charisma, uh, and then he was gone. They just uh, snuffed him out. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think there was any way he would have gotten out alive in that area over there in Dallas. Oh, no. No, no, they weren't going to let it happen. They, they had mm-hmm. determined, you know, and the night before, um, they met at Clint Murkison's mansion in Dallas, uh, a number of the conspirators, and they signed off on the killing. And actually, uh, I got confirmation of this uh, from Rod McKenzie, who's a fellow who's still alive, and I visited him with him last year, uh, and he told me how uh, the week after the assassination, um, he went out drinking with Malcolm Wallace, who was one of the shooters, and Wallace told him all about it. So, mm. wow. you know, a lot of people on the Internet, um, some of them don't believe McKenzie's account, but uh, personally I do, uh, Rod McKenzie. Uh, he was a disc uh disc asset and a manager of a safe house in Dallas uh, at the time, the Holland Avenue safe house. 
Um, and he's still alive now. And I went up and interviewed him. Uh, and he knew a lot of these characters. And uh, he told me that Wallace had told him they'd met the previous night at Clint Murkison's Dallas mansion. And about 30 of them had signed off on the killing uh, wow. the, the following day. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it doesn't sound far fetched to me. But you know yeah, I mean, and I put it in a. Oh, excuse me. No, I was just gonna say, well, why weren't these people arrested? I mean, if they're starting to come out of the woodwork now, we're starting to get confirmation. Why can't we go after them? Well, I don't know. I, <laughs> um, they they tried to reopen the investigation a number of times, and I, I it, it never seems to work because really, the government agencies were behind it, and so they're not going to let themselves get convicted. Right. I mean. You know, I, I, I don't have any idea how we would go about that. But the best I could do is I, I documented this stuff and, and put it in my books. And I, I've got six books on Amazon Books under Richard Hook uh, with all of, all of my research. And uh, that, that's uh, – I did two books – actually, two books with Rod McKenzie, uh, the, uh, the, the manager of the Holland Avenue Safe House who was in the Chicago Mafia and a disc asset. They're called – the men that don't fit in. There's a small edition and a large edition, uh, and he's got his account in there uh, of 1963 in Dallas when he was managing that hay- safe house. When a lot of these uh, questionable characters uh, he ran into, and he, and we ta- he, I, I've got his account. It's about 100 pages in my book, The Men That Don't Fit In. People can get that on Amazon Books. That's excellent. Yeah, your books are incredible. So I encourage everybody to, to actually purchase those books and read them. You know, they're not going to get this information anyplace else. I know a lot of people are researching and have done a lot of research on the JFK, but I think you've come up with some very, very unique information. And the one thing we, you know, I want to just get back to that picture you talked about earlier about Oswald being in the hallway. Um, you know, where's that photograph now? I mean, that should be enough right there to just say, hey, he was innocent. Well, <laughs> it, it, it is, but really... Uh... Well, I mean, in my books, I've got that figure blown up multiple times. Actually, my most recent book, uh, I noticed you clicked on it on Facebook. It's called The Path Toward Truth. And I've got a chapter on Oswald in the, in the doorway there. And that photo is in that book. And people can download The Path Toward Truth for free this week. I'm offering it for free. Uh, onto your laptop, iPhone, or iPad, or personal computer off of uh, Amazon Kindle Books. They'll download a simulator, and you can get my book for free, The Path Toward Truth, and uh, it's got all this in there. And it's got the Alkin 6 photo. Uh, see, initially, Solaris, they, they said it was another guy, Billy Lovelady. Uh, it wasn't Oswald in the doorway. Uh, and with the initial... Uh, releases the photos like in Life magazine and in the newspapers, it was so hazy that we really couldn't tell for sure if it was Oswald or Lovelady. It's only been in recent years with personal computers that we were able to really blow it up. And it's, I'm telling you, it's like the Twilight Zone. Here we are, 50 years later, we blow it up, and it's got the features of Oswald exactly. I, it, Solaris, it's yeah. like the one night I was telling you, I blew it up on my screen, and I just froze right up. It's, it's him. I, yeah, you know, I, I, knew it that, I knew it that night when I was looking at it on my computer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what's so interesting. And even now, we have the facial recognition and everything else with computers. But, yeah, there's software. You can probably even go deeper with it. But Yeah, yeah and there's a guy, there's a guy who did. Um, Larry Rivera uh, used, uh, you know, were they over, overlays and this kind of stuff, uh, and it matches up with Oswald exactly. So, mm-hmm. and it doesn't match Lovelady. Actually, it turns out that Lovelady was in the doorway also, but he was in the opposite corner. There's a guy with his hands over his head, shielding uh, his bald head from the sun. Lovelady was bald, and he was over in the opposite opposite corner. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he was in the doorway. Lovelady, Lovelady was in the right-hand corner, which was another employee there, and Oswald was in the left-hand corner. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were, they were both in the photo. Well, but Larry just... Rivera, oh, excuse me, I just want to give a plug for Larry because he's my friend. He, he, <laughs> he took my stuff to another level. He even did some stuff with animation. So, nice. Very good. Yeah, he did a very good job. People can look him up. Larry, Larry Rivera, just scan for him on the net. 
Well, that's awesome. Well, I think that because we have that, at least that right there can tell everybody that we probably should do something about, uh, you know, history and, and correcting the books and so far as blaming Oswald. You know? Yeah, I, you know, as far as uh, legally, I, I'm not really for that. The thing is, I wanted to know, and if in my books, people can know, the, interf- the information is there, and they can know the truth, they can know, and so, and so they'll know in the future, everything that you're told is not the truth, you have to be skeptical, that's the final thing to learn. I totally agree. Yeah, well, yeah. since everything's been airbrushed, our whole our whole world has been airbrushed. History's been airbrushed and censored. And it seems to me like these <laughs> these alphabet agencies obviously are running the show, and they're still yeah. running the show. <laughs> well, they are, you know. And this this really is a real example because they blew it, Solaris. So what they did is they should have had somebody up there close to Oswald, making sure that he couldn't bail. Okay, mm-hmm. but the t- but it turns out. The shooter, Wallace, went to the opposite end of the floor, and you can look at the pictures of the building at the time of the shooting. The windows are wide open on the opposite end. Wallace was shooting down from there, and then Oswald was able to come downstairs. And actually, there's a book out by Judith Barry Baker, who was his mistress uh, in New Orleans the previous summer, and the book's called David Ferry. It's a book about David, but in the back of that book, uh, she ta- she tells about how she talked with Oswald a few days before November 22nd on the phone, and he told her he was a, he was going to hang in there until it was too late to replace him with another shooter, and so that's what he did. He hung in there like he was going to be a shooter until he was able to bail, and so mm-hmm. he tossed a couple of spent shells down out of his pocket. He bailed, stashed the rifle back by the stairwell and came down and got in the doorway and he, he never wanted to shoot JFK uh, but he also tried to make it appear like he had done his CIA job he tossed those shells down but he didn't fire any shots and actually they blamed the shooting of JD Tippett a half hour later in Oak Cliff on him but he didn't do that either and we've proven that I've got that in my book too he went to the movie theater he never even went to 10th and Patton uh, and we've, pr- we've proven that because the distinctive overshirt that he's got on in the doorway in Alkin 6 photo, it's a long brown uh, tweed long sleeve overshirt. He also had on, when he was being dragged out of the photos by the Texas Theater when he was arrested, yet the witnesses at 10th and Patton descri- described a guy in a, in a short waist cut white Eisenhower jacket. It, it, it wasn't Oswald at all. He was never even there. So um, they, what they did is they, they, they said that he, he shot the policeman. And the minute you shot a policeman in those days, that just got everybody sure that he had shot the president. And that one thing led to another, and they were ready to hang him right then, you know. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I know there was uh, some people saying that he was, Oswald was under some form of mind control. Do you subscribe to that? Um, you know what? I don't have any proof of that, but it is possible, yes. It's possible that morning. See, the thing is, um, in New, or- New Orleans the previous summer, Judith Berry Baker, uh, who uh, uh, met with, was working with Lee Oswald and David Ferry there in New Orleans, she said that David Ferry used to hypnotize Oswald all the time, practicing mm-hmm. on him. And uh, it might have just not, not just been an idle hobby. It's possible they could have put him on- under at some point the morning of the 22nd uh, to try and get him to be more likely to do his job. But even in Judith's book, she says that David Ferry wasn't successful at hypnotizing Oswald. He would fake it sometimes. And mm-hmm. I think in the, in the end there, even if they put him under, I think he faked like he was under and he still bailed under his own accord. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense right there. So what agency or which, which group of people really contracted the hit for on the, CIA, the CIA, the, C- sure. the CIA was the main one because um, if you, if you list them off, uh, there were more uh, shooters and spotters, assistants that were CIA than anything else. Uh, the guys behind the scenes weren't just CIA. I mean, there were oil, Texas oil barons. There was the vice president, Lyndon Johnson. There was the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, who wasn't innocent either because those disc agents 
were under his jurisdiction, like Mac Wallace, who was on the sixth floor. So there's one shooter right there, Malcolm Wallace, that was under Hoover. But the majority of them were CIA, yes. All that picket fence action where the gun was run off and all that, that was a CIA plan thing where Frank Sturgis oversaw the whole thing. He was CIA uh, from Operation 40, actually uh, in the Bay of Pigs. He had worked under Nixon. Operation 40 was the group there of the assassins. Frank Sturgis headed that uh, uh, for Richard Nixon, who was vice president to Eisenhower uh, at that time. So they just used Sturgis all over again. And then Sturgis popped up again, who was one of the Watergate burglars. So he, they, they kept going back to him. Frank Sturgis was their main man. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's really but interesting. CIA, to answer your question, uh, CIA was the main one. Charles Harrelson, Roscoe White, Frank Sturgis, Chuck Nicoletti, James Files. They all at least were CIA assets and some of them agents. And Lee Oswald, actually, he was a CIA agent also. Mm-hmm. Well, that's incredible. And there's still, obviously, you know, there's so many levels to corruption. It's quite disgusting when you look into the illusion of history and see what's really going on. You know, I well, it is. And when doing, you Richard. think that, oh, excuse me. I was just saying, I applaud you for what you're doing. You've done some extensive research, and I really appreciate what you do. Well, thank you. You know, and the thing is, all of the effort that's put into this, like the CIA, the money and the thinking they put into it, if they'd put it toward positive stuff in the world, I think where we'd be. I mean, we, we would be so much better off. It's just a shame that such energy goes in the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. It's too bad, isn't it, that things have to go in that spiral. I always wonder what, what the world would have been like had they not assassinated him. We probably could have taken ourselves so further forward, we can't even imagine it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree, too. And I remember when I heard you on Lorraine's show, that's when I first uh, I started listening to you on, on Lorraine when, when you were her guest. And what's interesting oh, yeah. is uh, I, I asked you that question about Jacqueline Kennedy because when I saw the video um, and the film of his assassination, it's, it's like she, she, if it were me and I was his wife, I would have pushed him down so that he wasn't I know. getting hit. And I couldn't figure out what, and I asked you if she was in on it or you suspected she might have known. Yeah, I just don't it's know. It's possible. I, I, mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's you something know, that really uh, stands out. Well, I can tell you, even as a little kid, I felt uneasy about it. I said to my mom, why did she act like that? Okay. Mm. It's like she backed away from him. Yes. And then afterward, as a little kid, I always wondered why she wasn't hysterical, screaming all over the place. Okay. Mm-hmm. And actually, if, if your husband was getting shot, actually, I thought Nellie Con- Conley performed more normally where she pulled her husband down, back down flat. Mm-hmm. See, after he was shot in the throat, I would think the instinct would be to jump right on top of him and pound him right down on the seat. Okay, right, exactly. Yeah. But I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe she was just stunned. And I don't have any, any proof. Uh, uh, I, I don't, I don't know. You know, I, I, I really don't know. I bring it I, up maybe I'm I... in partial denial. Uh, the, the media put them up as Camelot and we had this beautiful first lady, Jackie, and maybe, maybe I hate to admit that it's going to take another researcher to, to crack that one. I don't know that I'll ever do it. That's okay. I, I just studied that. You know, I kept looking at that film and the one thing I did notice was that it seems to me like she was almost holding him in place so that he would get shot. A second time. I, it's, and that's it, my it, point. Right, and it's. It, I, I've. I admit that I've. I've observed the same thing you're saying. Yeah, uh, and I actually, they, they said that he. She visited with Aristotle and Ossus on his boat, like a week or two before. Isn't that correct? Yeah, I believe so. So yeah. what was going on there? You know, that's the question. Well, you know, it just seems a little suspicious to me, and I don't like pointing fingers either. I just observe. You know, I have that background, yeah. too. I just observe things. And I would say that if you're trained as a spouse, even with situations with high-profile people, you know self-defense and you know how to get down, especially your Secret Service probably told her and, and trained her how to shoot and et cetera and all that stuff. So yeah. it just surprised me. It really did. So, right. Yeah, and of well, course, you I know. Just, go ahead. Oh, excuse me. That's all right. Go ahead. Well, they might have, they, you know, they might have told her, uh, that, that we're going to kill him, whether you like it or not. So you'd better just uh, sit back and don't do anything. I, I don't know, you know. That's um, possible. You know, but they, yeah. they definitely, even what she was wearing, the pink suit and hat with the hat on top, that makes it easy for the gunman to avoid her, you see. Mm-hmm, yep. Because Absolutely. you can see where her head is. Mm-hmm. 
Because I, yep. whether, and I don't, you know, she might have just been, uh, I, I mean, that dress, I think, was manufactured by Zapruder's dress company. So go figure, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I smell <laughs> rats everywhere with this case. I tell you what. I know. Well, that's one of the reasons that people have been uh, into it for so long. I mean, uh, it goes on and on. I mean, I could do a 10-hour show and still have more that I didn't tell you, you know. Mm-hmm, exactly. And as far as the Zapruder film goes, that was also edited. I mean, that obviously wasn't the real, real-time real footage, or, or didn't they do some things to tweak it? Right. Well, we didn't get to see it for 12 years, so what were they doing oh, with it the whole geez. time, you know? Right, yeah. That's I mean... <laughs> <laughs> but but the thing is, everybody described the car coming to a virtual stop. But when you watch the Zapruder film, the car goes right down the street like some sort of carnival ride. So they obviously removed some frames when the car slowed down. Mm-hmm. Right. And Secret that, Service was told to stand down, too, right? Um, They were. See, that's the thing. Um, They... If it was a normal reaction, they would have returned fire. There was a couple guys with machine guns there. They could have shot up that uh, that little uh, that little twig pick, picket fence, uh, and the guys behind there would have been killed. They could have just sprayed it, but they didn't right. even return one shot. Yeah, that's what's so suspicious. Yeah. You know, the thing is, the night before at the Dallas Cabana Motel, um. Frank Sturgis was witnessed being paid by E. Howard Hunt of the CIA a big wad of cash, obviously, to, to manage the hit. Uh, and then this Rod McKenzie uh, that I met with was uh, moved to the Dallas Cabana Motel out of the Holland Avenue safe house so they could, this, Wallace and the hit team could plan in the safe house. But McKenzie was making fake ID at the Dallas Cabana Motel. And he was in his window late at night, and he observed a limousine pull up and, and Richard Nixon get out and go in and visit with Frank Sturgis inside his room for half an hour. So, you know, here's the guy who was his boss in Operation 40 in the Bay of Pigs. Um, it seems to me going in there and giving him a final guarantee uh, that, if he, that uh, if he does a job to shoot the president, there's not going to be any return fire, and we're going to let you get away. That's the way it looks to me. Mm-hmm. I think you're very good at what you do, Richard. <laughs> I think you're very perceptive <laughs> on that level. There's a question here in the chat, and uh, they're indicating oh, the good. autopsy photos. They're asking about the autopsy photos, so I, I, any insight on those? Um, well, I, that isn't really my specialty. Actually, the... the uh, the guy that's really specialized in that is uh, Professor Jim Fetzer, uh, and uh, a do- there's a Dr. David Mantic. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can look those fellows up. Uh, I'm not really an expert on the autopsy photos, but the only thing I can say is from the minute uh, that his, uh, his body was taken back east, I mean, it, it really betrays the fact that the military was involved uh, because it was at a military hospital back east, uh, Bethesda, and they're the only ones that could have controlled that whole thing. It, it, it couldn't have been the mafia. It had to have been uh, the U.S. military that took control at that point. Um, but, I mean, per, uh, Dave, Dr. Mantic has shown that, uh, that you can see uh, particles uh, throughout the brain of a frangible bullet, the final headshot was probably an exploding bullet, uh, and that's what James Files, who f- claims to have fired the final headshot, says that he fired. So it hits hit uh, JFK above his uh, in his right temple, and then uh, and then exploded. So there's really uh, less less a- evidence. They used that bullet from the front there in the end. Uh, it, it made sure that he was killed, and it didn't provide immediate evidence but now in the in the photos we can see particles of uh mercury or fragments of metal throughout his brain uh, but i'm not the expert on there look up david mantic or professor uh, jim fetzer they're the experts on the autopsy photos excellent yeah do you think that he had a premonition jfk about his assassination before he arrived do you think he had a foreboding? Um, i do yeah. oh yeah I, I mean i think um he actually i uh, he he said to somebody uh, he observed that it would be really easy to, uh, uh, for someone to get shot from a, 
you know, from a high window with a high powered rifle, but there were even movies out at the time. Uh, wasn't it? There was one that was a Manchurian candidate where there was a presidential assassin with a rifle. Mm-hmm. I mean, was that Frank Sinatra? I mean, <laughs> I mean, people were thinking along these lines already. I mean, uh, and uh, yeah. JFK was fully aware of that. Uh, uh, you know, he did, he just rode right into it. Uh, he should have. He should have never. Uh, he should have. Like in Chicago, on November second, they canceled the motorcade. They should have canceled it in Dallas. They should have never let him go through there. You know. I agree. Yeah, I so agree with you on that one. I, I would. I would say that when when you have that many people after you, you would get a real red flag insofar as energetically go to not to go to a destination like that. It's it's really a shame that that yeah. happened. I swear. It, it's just terrible that this this goes on in our country. And the fact of the matter is it's gone on in a sense that it's been our alphabet agencies were really manipulating the show here and have caused an awful lot of problems for a very long time. So that's really just, I don't even know what to say about it. Now I wasn't even, I was like six months old when, when this happened, I was a, I was a little kid. So baby. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just up, some... you know? <laughs> well, the one thing is uh, in my book, uh, uh, 12 shots that shook the world. You can get that on, uh, Kindle on Amazon, uh, Amazon Kindle, but I give the account in the beginning of the book of, of that weekend when I was a little boy and what it was like. So, um, people can read that. And uh, I tell, um, what it was like the way I remember it. I, I was seven years old. Uh, and I can remember the teacher coming in crying and saying the president uh, was shot. You all have to go home. Uh, I can I can still picture it right now. I'm telling you, it was just such a shock, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure it's, it's uh, almost like cellular trauma. And also, what's your website? If anybody wants to reach out to you or connect with you, how's, what's the best way to do that? Um, well, I don't have a website. It's, my Facebook page is Oswald Was Not a Shooter. Um, you can become a member there uh, and send me uh, messages there, and I'll always get back to you. Uh, or uh, th- then my books are on Amazon uh, Books. Uh, but uh, the main thing is Facebook. I have my personal page, uh, and then I have my uh, group there. Oswald was not Oswald was not a shooter. And if uh, you send me a message, uh, I'll, whoever it is, I'll get back to you. You know. Well, that's excellent. Well, we have about four minutes plus or minus here, but I just want to thank you so much for joining us, Richard. I also have you scheduled for my other show, Hyperspace. So I'm really excited because uh, you have some incredible information. And I encourage everybody to purchase your books. And, and once again, you know, you have that one book for free, right, that they can download. For the um, that's right. For this week, The Path Toward Truth. It's a really good deal. I, mm-hmm. I have a lot of things in there. It's 450 pages, The Path Toward Truth, uh, Amazon Kindle books. They can download it for free. Excellent. And, and when you started finding answers to this equation of what, what was really going on, did you ever get harassed? Have you been bothered? A little bit. Uh, it's been a long time. Uh, it's really been a mixed bag. Uh, some, some crazies, uh, I I don't know, maybe we could go on (laughs) into that on a, on another show, but, uh, it it hasn't been that bad. I mean, for the most part, Solaris, people are just very mixed up about our country things there's so much disinformation they don't know what to think i i've tried to give a little order on this one thing i'm not an expert in all the current events uh but i specialized on this and in doing that concentrating on it i was able to discover a few more things for people so they're in my books you've done an incredible job and also are you doing any public speaking or presentations anytime soon well, I don't know. I was thinking about doing one for Lorian uh, this uh, October at her group oh, yeah. in Petaluma. You should. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I'll probably do that, uh, but that's, that's all that I have uh, planned at this point. Well, it sounds good. Yeah, keep us, keep us informed on that one for sure. So, so what was the connection between GFK and, and Bobby Kennedy? Why did they take him out? Um, well, uh, Bobby, uh, it looked like he was going to be able to become president, and they really didn't want another Kennedy to be president. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, actually, they had just taken Martin Luther King, King out a few months before that. Mm-hmm. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover accomplished that one. Uh, and then in June, they got Bobby. Uh, but they, they didn't want him to become president. Another thing is he may... Uh, he, he, he most likely would have reopened the in investigation into his brother's death. 
uh, and gotten to the bottom of that, and they couldn't allow that to happen. Mm-hmm, exactly. If he had become president, he would have had a lot more power to do that. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of and sense. And that's what they were afraid of. You know, and they, so then they, they wanted Nixon to get in there. Nixon had been beaten by JFK, and they, they didn't want him uh, not get to, another Kennedy to, to, to beat him the next time. They wanted Nixon to get in there, and so Nixon did get, subsequently did get in, mm-hmm. uh, got to be president. But if they ha- hadn't have killed Bobby, uh, uh, I, uh, well, Bob, Bobby quite, very possibly could have become uh, president, Bobby Kennedy. They, but he was assassinated, uh, too. Uh, Sirhan Sirhan, uh, even if he did fire one shot or so, the pantry there was all shot up so, with more shots than could have been fired from one guy by far. So um, they, he, they killed Bobby also, uh, agents within our own. And actually, um, there, there is a book out uh, uh, about, about that. Well, actually, the book, the book, no, the book I'm thinking not isn't about Bobby. It's about Martin Luther King by William Pepper that documents how the FBI uh, uh, was behind the Martin Luther King killing that, that by William Pepper. People can look that one up. There's a book out that documents that. There's a, the shooter was Frank Strausser uh, that shot Martin Luther King. It's unveiled in that book by William Pepper. Mm-hmm. Excellent information. And Richard, I can't believe we're out of time here. I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been a pleasure and an honor. And have a well, wonderful thank Memorial you. Day weekend. Yes, and I'll have you back very soon. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Great questions and chat. And until next time, everybody, be safe out there. Memorial Day weekend. All right, bye-bye. Okay, Solaris. I'll talk to you later. Okay, bye, Richard. All right, bye-bye.